So today's video is going to be on how to stay healthy uh, while doing pottery. It's, uh, I did a blog post on it um, a few months ago um, and I meant to do a video at the time and never quite got around to it. I'm throwing a planter at the moment so hopefully I can do that at the same time as talking. Should be able to do it nice and straightforward. So, um, first disclaimer, I'm going to recommend some stuff but at the end of the day uh, I'm not a doctor and I'm definitely not your doctor so the usual warnings apply. Uh, always talk to someone who knows what they're talking about and knows you before starting anything that you think might be a problem but I'm not going to recommend anything out of the ordinary or, or dangerous particularly just you know, take it with that disclaimer in mind. Um, before I did pottery I had a desk job and I also did powerlifting as a hobby. So I kind of come at the problems that you get from pottery which are awkward posture um, and lifting heavy things um, from two more extreme versions of it. So I sat around at a desk for eight hours a day during the day and then would go home and work out and lift weights. Um, for the record, my best lift, I never competed at powerlifting, I just did it for fun, um, just trained for fun. Uh, and my best gym lifts were a sumo deadlift of 220 kilos, uh, a low bar squat of 180, and a bench of 130 at a body weight of around 70 to 75 kilos. So, um, certainly nowhere close to setting any records. But, and I didn't quite get the three, four, five plates. But, you know, um, I did it for a while. Very much enjoyed it. Even though I wasn't exceptionally good at it. So, the way I was looking at it in the blog post is you've got um, kind of three parts of uh, physical health that you can address while, as it re relates to pottery. Um, the, the first one is the habits that you get into. So they're the kind of almost unconscious things where a small change actually if you could make the change and stick to it would cost you nothing essentially you just you change how you work or how you stand um, and it improves your physical health um, but it's it's very difficult to get into habits but if you can get into habits and they become automatic uh, your body will thank you for it so that's probably the easiest once they're implemented and the hardest to implement um, will be habits um, then you've got kind of more deliberate practices that you can get into um, like stretching before you throw or something like that where you know you it's a deliberate thing you have to stop and take a few minutes to do it but you do it inside the studio and um, you do it with a specific goal in mind uh, and then the third much broader category would be everything you do outside of the studio um, like whether or not you work out or run or do yoga or anything like that so there'd be things that you'd do either deliberately for pottery or more broadly for health reasons um, but they're not in the studio they're done possibly at home possibly in a gym um, but they're more time consuming um, and less targeted at pottery. So the main one that I think is going to be relevant uh, for a lot of people, now in case you haven't seen this before, I'm using my laser and what I do is I throw a planter, set the laser to just outside the base of the planter, I'm just casting a vertical line, no horizontal, uh, and it gives me a mark to throw the tray to. So I will now throw a tray that it will fit the planter. I'm using uh, Nick and Stuart Hartley and Noble sent me some. I'm not sure if these are going to become a thing or if they already are, but they're testing a, an alternative material because obviously sourcing materials 
the moment it's just getting harder and harder. So it's um, one-sided, the reverse is this board, but it's even smoother than their normal ones, which are great for these because I leave them on the bat until they pop off. Um, meaning that these particularly smooth ones come off with a particularly smooth base, so I, I really like these. Um, yeah, so the, the habits, uh, a big one would be posture. So posture is you kind of, in a way, it's um, it's not something you, you just decide, but in a way it is. So there are parts, of, muscle imbalances will affect your, your posture, but it's also part habit. If you're used to slouching, um, you'll slouch automatically. And if you're used to standing and sitting well, um, your muscles will thank you for it. So slouching is comfortable in the short term, not great in the long term. Uh, sitting with good posture is not so comfortable, but better in the long run. Um, but a lot of the time, if you're sitting at a desk or doing something like that, you'll have uh, muscle imbalances. They occur at the shoulder and at the hip mostly. Well, I say all of this, this is from what I learnt while I was doing powerlifting, I haven't really looked into it much since then, but this was certainly the case. Uh, this is what was recommended five years ago. So you get what's called upper cross syndrome, which is where your chest is tight and your kind of your shoulders are rounded in, um, and it's basically an imbalance of the four muscles that form a cross in your upper back and then anterior pelvic tilt, which is the same thing at your hips, where your, your abs and your glutes and all the muscles that control the hip, some are tight, some are weak, and they twist it into a position that it shouldn't be in, and that becomes your resting state. So what you need to do to address these is um, you want to stretch and you want to strengthen, um, and then you want to make a conscious effort to improve the posture. So you want to make sure you're not slouching, you want to sit with good posture, you want to stand with good posture. Um, easier said than done, but uh, those would be something to look into if you have any of those kind of things where like the classic uh, sat at the computer desk postures, if you've got any of those sorts of issues, uh, anterior pelvic tilt and um, up cross syndrome and how you fix those, they're well documented on the internet. Uh, if you Google them, you'll get a thousand different suggestions, but essentially it's all just strengthening and stretching to improve that, um, that imbalance of muscles and flexibility. Um, another habit to get into is stretching before you do stuff. So. In, in talking in terms of being in the studio, uh, that could be. Oh no, sorry, I jumped ahead. No, stretching will be the next broad category. Um, the next thing to do in the studio would be to look at. Uh, now I'm going to throw some mugs. Just wondering what I'm up to. Uh, I'll set it to 10 10 for some mediums. Yeah, so uh, how you set up the studio matters. And so if I have a banding wheel that, like most banding wheels, it's about that tall. So I work with that when I'm stamping patterns because I want them more in line. I don't want to hunch over when I'm stamping because I stamp for you know five or 10 minutes a piece maybe. And if I've got uh, quite a few pieces to work through, I could be sat for an hour, say. And you want to have everything at a comfortable level. Like with, if you're familiar with how to set up a computer desk, the monitor should be kind of at eye level. You don't want to be bent over to look at it and why laptops become quite uncomfortable if you've worked on a laptop for any length of time. Um, similar sort of thing. You want to, uh, to have your workspace set up in such a way that good posture is easy rather than fighting against everything to have good posture. And so part of that can be raising surfaces up, 
so that you're working at a comfortable level. Um, so I throw standing. I don't actually throw standing because I had an issue with throwing sitting. I did it because I prefer the, the way it allows me to interact with things on the studio. You can get on and off the wheel much faster. You don't have to kind of sit down and set yourself up each time. Um, my old wheel was seated only. It had a seat attached to it. When I got this uh, scut wheel, it came with the leg extenders, although that was part of why I chose this one. I didn't know if I wanted to throw standing at that point, but I wanted to give it a go. I really like it. I think it's more comfortable. It comes with other issues, like you end up, um, if you stand with one foot on the pedal, you're putting most of your weight on the other foot, which um, over time that kind of, well, you know what it's like to stand for long periods of time. It's not great, but you can, um, as long as you're wearing good shoes, standing on a good floor, so you can get mats if you're on a hard floor, you can get mats to soften it, and you're wearing good shoes that are comfortable for long periods of time, it's not an issue, um, and I find it more comfortable than sitting for long periods of time. Uh, but certainly if you've got some of the back pain associated with um, sitting for long periods of time and you have the option to throw standing, give it a go. Um, if you've got a wheel where you can buy the leg attachments, you could probably buy them, try them, put them up on eBay for 90% of what you paid for them. So it's not like you have to commit to the cost of the leg extenders, you just have to commit to the time of selling them on if you don't like them. Um, but I would recommend that as a, as a consideration at least. Um, another one is if you t find yourself hunching over so that you can kind of look at the form or you, when you're throwing something your position's not great because of you're trying to look at what you're doing you put a mirror somewhere else. Um, I actually use the screen on the camera a lot of the time to watch. I can see the shape but it means you don't have to kind of keep leaning back or bending over. You can sit more upright, stand more upright and watch yourself in something that's a, at a more comfortable position. Um, I don't actually, yeah, I don't have a mirror but I do the same sort of thing. Um, a big one would be how you set up your studio, assuming you've got a studio that you control the setup, um, in terms of where you put things. So you don't want to have heavy buckets of uh, glaze and bags of clay stored somewhere that they're awkward to get to. Um, people usually, when they injured themselves working out, it was more common that they injured themselves putting the plates away rather than doing the lift because that's more awkward. Even though it's a lot lighter weight, you're talking about one bar, sorry, one plate off a bar that would have had many plates on it. So as a portion of the weight, it's quite insignificant. It's the twisting and the, the awkwardness of it. So don't store your heavy things somewhere tucked away underneath something where you've got a twist to get them. Try and make that part of your studio design around storing them as comfortably as you can. Um, but that might not be a problem for you and it also might not be an option for you. Uh, another thing that also might not be a problem or option for you, but if it is worth addressing, is how hard your clay is. Because a firm clay, and a lot of them are quite firm out of the bag, will do your hands and your forearms in at a rate that a soft clay won't, and there's no need for it. You don't really gain much from throwing with a, a harder clay. Sometimes it's quite useful so you can put more force in. If you get a clay that's really soft, it can be harder to work with because of that. But um, my two clays are of different softnesses, and it took a while before I started bothering, but I'm so glad I did. I have to soften the dark clay before I throw it. So I put water in the bag. Uh, a good way, if you can, is you pour some water in the bag with it, not a huge amount, and then you submerge the whole bag in a bucket of water, and the pressure of the water outside the bag forces the water inside the bag to actually kind of get through into the clay. If you don't do that, what happens is your clay ends up sitting in a puddle of water 
um, but if you're leaving it for long enough that can be fine because it will gradually work its way through um, but if you do it like the night before you want to put it in a bucket of water so that it's not just one side of the clay that's something wet and the other side's still too firm so yeah that's a good one for addressing kind of wrist pain and forearm pain that you might well get if your clay is really firm out of the bag um, and then a big one is the routine that you have in the studio. So I don't spend more than generally about an hour on any one process. I can be at the wheel quite a lot, but it's I, keep, I get on and off the wheel to do different things. So I, the way I work is I throw somewhere between a couple and maybe 10 to 20 pieces a day. Generally, maybe it's eight. It's quite a good number because these Hartley and Noble bats fit on my um, the, uh, plywood board that I'm putting it on. I get eight of them on. So I quite often will throw eight things, eight mugs. And if you're doing eight mugs, you've got eight mugs to trim from the mugs you threw yesterday. You've got eight mugs to handle from the day before that. Um, and then you'll also have glazing and packing to do and disperse with that. I prefer that to throwing all day, trimming all day, handling all day and so on and so forth which some makers do and obviously that's in a lot of ways more efficient uh, it lets you get into a groove more but the downside is that you end up spending a long time in a single position which can be less than ideal in terms of pain so um, you often hear in terms of posture people say uh, the best seated position or the best posture is your next one as in there's no good posture if you're going to be doing it all day you want a, a variety you want to keep moving because whatever you do if you hold that position for eight hours it's not going to be fun um, and the same sort of applies for this and the easiest way to make sure that you're doing that is to um, break the processes up um, that's pretty much it for habits, or at least they're the ones that I thought of. There'll probably be some other ones that are unique to different people, but those are the things that I kind of think about. Um, then stretching before you throw. I, I'm not the best at doing this. I need to kind of be reminded once my body starts to hurt, then I remember, um, but I'll, stick the link that I posted in the blog post. Um, there are guides to stretching your wrists which is really worth doing before throwing, especially if your clay is a bit on the harder side. Um, because if your wrists are tight you end up um, restricting the movement so you're now rather than throwing in a way that's comfortable and not doing any damage you're throwing in a way that's uncomfortable but is also at the extreme end of either you know how far you've got the range of motion from the ligaments or the muscle whatever you're now pushing against something so it's uncomfortable and it's going to make the problem worse so it's if it's a, an issue you have stretch before throwing um, if you're faced with anything physical like moving in a delivery of clay or anything like that and you think you're going to suffer for it the next day just warm up a little bit just use a, a standard five minute stretching warm up that you would do before doing some sport and do that before throwing, do that before moving clay in. Um, any of these things your body will thank you for and there is no downside to it other than the loss of five minutes. So those are things that I'm not great at doing but I would recommend if you can remember to do them. Um, yeah, main areas would be your wrist, your neck and your chest generally if you're kind of quite hunched over and inward if you stretch your pecs it's a doorway stretch or something like that where you just basically stretch outward um, it opens up your chest and uh, lets you have a much more balanced neutral posture and stops you hunching over quite so much um, and then finally the last one is what you do outside the studio and this will be far more based in preference than um, these. So I 
like weightlifting, I do it for fun. Um, I'm not making any progress, but I just enjoy the process of it. I find it in, it's, once you're in the habit of it, it's like once you get used to running, um, the, the, the feeling of moving your body in a, a comfortable but challenging way is um, hard to describe in a way that makes sense if you've never done it, but if you have, you'll know what I mean. I like lifting weights. Um, but you can do yoga, Pilates, um, anything like that. Whatever you enjoy would be better than something that you don't, but if you're going to do something that you don't, kind of make it targeted to what you need. So something like yoga might be good, or stretching, have a specific stretching routine. But the main one for me, um, because that's all preference based, so you pick the one that you like, that you enjoy, um, is what you do while you're just sat around doing nothing. So <clears throat> while I'm watching TV, I've got a tool called a Theracane, which is great. I would highly recommend them. It's a kind of hooked plastic thing that lets you dig into the muscles of your upper back and neck, um, which if you've got a tight neck, tight upper back, it's an absolute godsend. Um, I'd highly recommend one of those if you have a tight upper back. It lets you really dig in and loosen up the muscles, like having a deep tissue sports massage, but you can do it while watching TV in a way that's really comfortable because it comes over your shoulders. So you hold it in front of you, but it digs in at the back. Um, also a lacrosse ball, which is great for your feet. If the bottom of your feet get tight, you might not even know that they do, but you'll know once you try using the lacrosse ball on them because it will hurt the first time you do it. But you just roll your feet on a lacrosse ball and it loosens up your feet and you'd be amazed at how much difference that makes. Um, and then the last one is a foam roller, which is kind of more of a, a broad tool. You can release basically all the muscles in your body if you use it, but it's kind of, you've got to have the floor space and the, the time to do that one. But the other two, you can do sat on a sofa, watching TV, you can just loosen up some of the muscles that get particularly tight um, and cause discomfort unnecessarily. Uh, so I'd really recommend the Theracane and the crossball. I'll put a link. Um, the Theracane's a, a slightly tricky one to find, but a lacrosse ball, you know, any lacrosse ball, where you're just looking for a hard round, moderately hard, not snooker ball hard, but harder than a tennis ball which is why lacrosse balls are great. You get ones that are sold specifically as massage balls. They're basically lacrosse balls with a different logo on. Um, that's pretty much it for what I would recommend. I'll do another video on the other aspects like silicosis and toxicity and things because I think that's a different subject. Um, it does come down in part to studio practices, but um, it's not just studio practices. So um, I'll cover that in a different topic, a different video. I'll link to the blog post, I'll link to everything that I mentioned. Uh, I'm going to stop now because my camera's flashing at me to tell me the battery is going to die any second. Um, but hopefully that's useful. Um, and if any of that didn't make sense, because for whatever reason it's hard to tell as I throw, uh, check out the blog post, which will, I, you know, I don't know wasn't throwing when I did that one, so it should make more sense, but hopefully that covered everything. Uh, let me know if you've got any suggestions. There are some suggestions from Instagram um, on the blog post, but they were broadly speaking along the same sorts of lines. Uh, but yeah, let me know in the comments if you've got anything that you think I missed, because that is what works for me, but it's definitely not a comprehensive list. Um, and yeah, hopefully that's useful.